great speakers on this topic. Um, and my name is Darlene Bolivar. I should introduce myself. I'm um, the Director of Quality and Patient Safety at the IWK Health Center in Halifax. And I'm one of the co-chairs of the National Patient Safety Collaborative through CASB. Um, and I will be opening the session today. My other co-chair is Tracy Rong, and she's from Keo in Ottawa. And she'll be closing the session today. And uh, between the two of us, we'll tag team along with Lisa throughout the presentation. Um, today's presentation is on the current drug shortage, impact, strategies, and solutions. And uh, the CASB Patient Safety Collaborative meets at the same time, the fourth Friday of every month. Uh, so for those of you who uh, this is your first time participating in one of our sessions, um, know that it's an open uh, webinar concept, and people are free to dial in at this time on the fourth Friday of each month. So. Um, as I said, today's topic is the current drug shortage. And it's not just about the current situation with the supplier that we're experiencing. But uh, hopefully we'll be able to have some conversation around the impacts of sole sourcing of drugs, on um, the ingredients or the drugs that come from countries who may be in the middle of or experience conflict, and what does that do to our supply chain and our ability to access some of these drugs in addition to the current situation with the Canadian supplier. So that's what we're hoping to do. As Lisa said, uh, we're hoping that uh, you have lots of questions or lots of comments at the end that we will field for you. And we have an hour and a half for today's um, broadcast, so that's great. I'm going to introduce the three speakers um, all at the beginning, and then I will turn it over to the first speaker uh, for the webinar. So our first speaker of the day is uh, Richard Jones who is the Vice President and Clinical Services of Patient Safety and Business Development at MedBuy. And in this role, Richard manages a diverse mix of portfolios, including pharmacy, strategic sourcing, business development, and clinical services. He's been a hospital pharmacist. He's been working with MedBuy members, government, and industry partners to advance strategic sourcing in pharmaceuticals. And he also plays a central role in advancing a number of quality improvement initiatives to ensure that patients are at the center of sourcing processes and broader industry programs. He has responsibility for MedBuy's business development activities, including marketing, member recruitment, and growth within its existing membership. And prior to joining MedBuy, Richard served as the Director of Pharmacy at London, Ontario's London Health Sciences Centre. He's got a diverse 30-year uh, background in pharmacy, not only in hospital settings, but also in pharmaceutical manufacturing sector and in the field of biochemical research. So um, welcome, Richard. Our second speaker, speaker sorry, is going to be Marcel Romanek, and he uh, started working with Alberta Health Services Pharmacy Department in Edmonton as a clinical practice leader in December of 2006. His clinical practice is currently in inpatient pediatric oncology, oncology at Stollery Children's Hospital, and he graduated from the University of Alberta faculty in 2000. He is also currently a clinical adjunct professor at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Alberta. He's involved in the profession through the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists, the Children's Oncology Group, the C17 uh, Canadian Pediatric Hematology Oncology Standards and Guidelines Committee, and the Pediatric uh, Pharmacy Advocacy Group. So welcome, Marcel. And our final speaker of the day is Regie Valencourt, and he is from, he's currently the Director of Pharmacy and Director of Integrated Pain Services at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, fondly known as CHEO. He's completed a Bachelor of Pharmacy, a Hospital Pharmacy Residency, and a Pharmacy Doctorate Degree. Um, so he provides clinical pediatric pharmacy support to palliative care and chronic pain services at CHEO. So a welcome, Regie. And um, as you can tell, we have three uh, well-prepared uh, speakers to uh, carry us through this topic today. And so without further ado, uh, Richard, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Darlene, for your kind introductory comments. And uh, just in the opening graphic here, I just wanted to sort of set the stage a little bit. Uh, as you probably recognize, those are the pyramids at Giza in Egypt. But because the sun is way off in the distance around the corner, 
I wanted to draw your attention a little bit to the fact that uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but it is a distance away, and we've got a few uh, uh, obstacles in the way to get through to it yet. But uh, and I'll come back to that, and hopefully it'll make sense as we get through the presentation today. Okay, so can we go to the next slide, please? So what I wanted to cover off this morning in the time that I have is a brief overview of the uh, current situation in Canada. And then, of course, we'll, we'll move on then to comments from uh, Marcel and then uh, Regis around impact within the hospital system. Next slide, please. So where we began. There has been a shift in the uh, ratio of the types of back orders that we're seeing. And it's a shift that's been occurring uh, over the last couple of years where we've had uh, a major departure from the traditional page of a regular uh, level, per se, of branded, uh, branded uh, back orders versus generics to being uh, a high preponderance of generics. There's also been a number of market dynamics that have been ongoing for uh, 25, 30 years and more. And I'll spend a bit more time talking about that. And then hopefully we'll put it in perspective as to what the Sentinel event of Sandoz represents, because it is a huge wake-up call for all of us. So the changes in the backorder rate itself. Um, we have seen a major increase in the last couple of years of backorders in general. There's been a significant shift uh, from the branded uh, base of uh, backorders to now include a high preponderance of generic backorders. Uh, we don't necessarily always understand what, what's driving these, but the trend is an interesting one to observe. And certainly within the MedPy organization, and I know our counterparts at HealthPro, it's raised some great concern by their respective memberships in how to manage the growing backorder rate. There have been many reasons, um, none the least of which is uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration inspector, uh, who's responsible for inspecting uh, uh, production sites around the globe for the U.S. environment and them alone, actually, uh, has been very active. And uh, there is some suggestion that they've actually gotten tighter on their requirements uh, and been more demanding of standards. There's even some suggestion they've even in increased the standards that are required. Uh, but there's no hard evidence to that effect, and I'm certainly not an expert in US law. There's another element uh, reaching back into my background within the industry that it has occurred. Uh, a decade or so ago, there was a, a long-standing run of merger and acquisition activity occurring amongst the branded houses on a global scale. This was an important development because at that time, contracting in, in different countries had undertaken many different strategies. And at the end of the day, if a company wasn't able to generate any positive margin contribution, in other words, profit off of a given SKU uh, that would contribute to their overall corporation uh, profitability, then they had a tendency to reduce their dependence on it and actually move it off of their production roster. Another issue that the industry has to contend with, and this is true for brand and generic, is that they, they need to have business uh, committed to them in order to keep their production facilities running uh, wherever they are in the globe. And what I mean by wherever they are in the globe, one of the other major developments over the last 20 years has indeed been rationalization of production facilities around the globe. In the generic arena, we've also now seen significant merger and acquisition activity. We, we no longer have major generic companies in Canada wholly owned within Canada. Uh, examples are uh, Sabex, was a wholly owned injectables uh, products company, which was purchased by Novartis under the Sandoz brand. Uh, Novartis is a branded house that also has a generic arm known as Sandoz. In the case of uh, Novo Farm, which some of you might recognize, it was purchased ultimately by Tiva out of Israel, uh, another uh, major global uh, generic company. And there are others, and more to come yet. Certainly, the branded industry has turned their eye to uh, purchasing uh, upstart biotech companies uh, because they believe their future is in the biological business. The whole critical point I'm trying to drive here, though, is that as a company is preparing to go through a change of ownership, the 
there's a normal analysis that occurs for every product that they produce. And that analysis looks at the business as well as the therapeutic perspective uh, of the product in the marketplace. Some companies place more attention to the impact of removing that product from uh, a marketplace like Canada than others do. And uh, so there's a great deal of variability around that. Next slide, please. So when we look at the whole business of um, generic companies going through rationalization of their product portfolio, and then certainly when a product goes off patent in Canada, we have a flurry of generic companies come on board and start to market their products. In time, however, as successive cycles of contracting and sourcing and so on, so on and so forth carry on, many of the initial flurry of participants in the marketplace step aside because they can no longer achieve the contribution margin that they need for that particular product. At the end of the day, it ultimately creates a single source generic situation. And in our current scenario, uh, there's like several drivers that get us there. One is, is that we have aggregation of purchasing power. And uh, another one is, is that we have uh, a publicly funded system that has to interface with a private commercial environment. And to be perfectly frank, no private commercial company can remain in business unless they make a reasonable profit. And there's been lots of debate around what constitutes a reasonable profit. Even policy changes at government, when we've seen recently governments reducing the price point of the first generic entry into a market post patent expiry to 25%, most recently 20% uh, just this week on the top 10 products uh, in the Ontario drug budget, but uh, ranging across the country between 25 and 35% in general terms. That causes huge changes to the revenue stream for the generic industry. And of course, begins the, the exercise of them taking a look at what is the potential profitability of a given product and can we afford to still make it and presented in the Canadian marketplace. It's also important to understand that no single company, generic or brand, may necessarily make the product in their own house. They may in fact source it from a different company altogether separate from themselves uh, in order to bring it into Canada and be the agent that launches it in the Canadian marketplace. The last element here that helped drive us towards uh, single source or sole source generics is the changes you know, at the provincial level in terms of contracting for uh, using public dollars. There's no doubt that the contracting should be balanced and fair in the market, should have adequate transparency and so on and so forth. But the, the changes that have come forward have mandated uh, a narrow range of options as to what can be negotiated, what has to be at the bid and quote kind of structure and so on and so forth. It makes it much more difficult to actually put aggregated value together on the table for any particular company. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the Sandoz situation. Clearly Sandoz is a, is a well-respected uh, generic company up until about February 7th of this year. They've had their problems with uh, back orders, uh, without doubt, um, but they, uh, they were originally the Sadex company and well-respected amongst hospital pharmacy because they focused on generic injectables and brought to market formats that hospitals couldn't get otherwise. It helped make hospital operations much more effective, much more efficient and cost-effective. As it relates to the current scenario of the Sentinel event, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration did issue a citation to Sandoz back in November but that citation identified three production facilities, not just one that we like to think of here in Canada. The other two were in the U.S., uh, Southwest U.S., and of course the one at Boucherville in Canada. The long and short of it is, is that there were some production infractions that were not meeting FDA requirements. And after many months of uh, an initial 
inspection and working with Sandoz across these three facilities, progress for remediation wasn't occurring. So a much more formal citation was necessary. And that's what was delivered in November of last year. So keeping in mind that Novartis, as a branded company, owns Sabex globally uh, outright. So it is the global parent of Sabex. Uh, it became quite an interesting exercise because the FDA cited the Boucherville plant for a small list of products that they produced there for the U.S. market. It consumed about 40% of the production capacity in Boucherville. The remaining capacity, the 60% of their production capacity, was for products made for the Canadian market exclusively. And of those, there was over 260 products, of which over 140 were sole source products, all are injectables for the purpose of our discussion here. Novartis' decision in order to satisfy remediation for the U.S. Uh, marketplace decided to cut production capacity back to 60% of total capacity uh, and in the process also decided that the original 40% of production capacity for the U.S. market had to be sustained. That meant then the Canadian production capacity went from 60% to 20% and I think it becomes pretty obvious why we are where we are, particularly given uh, a large majority of the products made for the Canadian marketplace were sole source products. Next slide, please. So what was, has been our response in Canada? I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what the group purchasing organizations have done, uh, some updates as to where the federal government is and what their response has been, also some response, uh, discussion on what the provincial governments have been, and then lead in a little bit to individual hospitals, which then Marcel and Rajiv still carry on. Next slide, please. From the group purchasing organization standpoint, Sandoz approached each of uh, Sigma Sante, the largest group purchasing organization in the province of Quebec, uh, Health Pro, a national GPO, and ourselves, Medbuy, as, as the other national GPO. They approached us on February 7th, and they went public with their announcement on February 14th. On February 16th, we all got together, the three GPOs and Sandoz, and we agreed on a couple of things. One is, is that the first and most important thing that occurs in any backorder situation is that hospital pharmacies or pharmacies in general generally don't know they're not getting a product until it doesn't show up. Or they go to try and order it on an electronic uh, system and discover there's no inventory available for them to receive. So that means there's precious little lead time to make any adjustments. The fact that you don't normally see or experience a, a large impact in hospital pharmacy is because the pharmacy itself typically adjusts things around so that as a patient care provider is uh, at the bedside, the impact is, is nominal at best. But rest assured, the pharmacy department scrambles regularly. In this case, the sheer number, the fact of that there was a large proportion of the business were sole source products that uh, with, with the Sandoz situation, it was simply overwhelming on top of the already baseline level of back orders we were addressing. So we, we decided that we had to first and foremost push out communication that was comprehensive, accurate, and timely, and continuously follow those three principles. And as GPOs, we had the most direct connection to the pharmacy directors and the vast majority of them right across the land. So getting that information into the pharmacy director's hands was first and foremost because it would buy them the most available time that was possible in order to start building contingency plans. In addition to that, we also felt that uh, the, the next big area is that some products are not going to be made available. There are some outright discontinuations and there are a number of products that have been suspended from production until 2013. The list that Sandoz had produced was based on a very thorough analysis using Health Canada's definition of medically necessary as a reference point. And they did, generally speaking, a pretty decent job of picking the core list. Um, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But therapeutic alternatives were an important uh, element to the picture that had to be considered in the grand scheme of things. 
And uh, in the time from when we as GPOs were first notified on February 7th to our meeting on the 16th, uh, uh, Sigma Sante had already been working with the Separate Curve Drug Information Service and had already had agreed to start sharing some of their recommendations for therapeutic alternatives. And we shared that amongst ourselves. The last item we all agreed to is that we would send a letter to um, the Deputy Minister of Health of Health Canada with suggestions that we felt would be reasonable and appropriate uh, to aid in easing the potential impact that might arise from this situation. Next slide, please. Richard, could you speak up just a little bit? Okay. Thank you. So this slide contains the, uh, the, the, the major uh, recommendations that we made as a, a group of GPOs. Um, HealthPro sent their own, and uh, Sigma Sante and Medby sent one collectively. And we're delighted to recognize that Health Canada has done everything in their power within the authority that they have to really bring all of these recommendations to the forefront and to really ex help expedite the exercise. The first recommendation was expedited review or, or product submissions for approval to be sold in Canada for products coming or replacing the products that are at risk at the Sandoz that uh, we expedite those, bring them to the front of the queue for review. Health Canada has done everything they can in that respect and as we sit here as of yesterday, there are 18 new notices of compliance. It's important to understand that no product can be sold in Canada without this review and approval. And so Health Canada has really stepped up and expedited the process to help uh, address the current scenario. In addition to that, we also recommended that although this special access program or SAP program, as you might hear of it, is not the right tool to be used for bringing products into Canada and, and putting them to use that do not have an SAP approval, sorry, an NOC uh, approval in this scenario. It is intended typically for a single physician, a single patient, and a single institution to make available a medication that has good science, good chance of success in caring for a patient, but not yet completed the NOC review in Canada. It's fair to say that the SAP program has indeed shifted their priorities again to assist in trying to ensure that products uh, where possible prior to NOC approval can be made available in Canada. And uh, from information coming out of a cross-country call a couple of days ago, the vast majority of the submissions under the SAP program to date have been for vitamin K. The last thing the federal government has done is established a weekly teleconference with the provinces and territories to, do, to achieve a couple of things. One is to um, escalate uh, issues and to share updates as the second part um, across the country. And that has actually been going on quite effectively. As GPOs, we've also had opportunity to meet with Health Canada uh, directly or in, uh, across teleconferences, but we've also been very active in the cross-country provincial territorial uh, teleconferences and also in some of our respective provincial um, teleconferences as well to help manage this exercise. Next slide, please. Provincial and territorial governments have been working with their constituent healthcare organizations locally um, to de determine a couple of key points. What is, what is the current status of supply within those jurisdictions? And what is the ability to shift inventory around so that patients are well served across the domain? And in collaboration with Health Canada, what are the key products that need to come forward for approval so that they can continue to make certain their approval review for notices of compliance are most effective and most efficient? at making product available in the country. And then also to network across the country for issues that are popping up in one area versus another and how people are addressing them. There is another group that has uh, been formed uh, of late and it, uh, it's a provincial, territorial and group purchasing organization uh, group 
led by the province of Alberta, and it's focused now on making recommendations for the future. So in a sense, we largely have the current scenario in a reasonable position of management. Now we're starting to look at how do we mi minimize the impact over the coming months, because it will be months, and how do we make changes for the future so that Canada is in a much better position to respond in any such situation in the future. Just going back one second and reflecting, it turns out that Health Canada had absolutely no authority to tell Novartis that they didn't like their solution. And there is a letter that's in the public domain from the federal health minister to the global president of Novartis expressing her concern and the risk to the Canadian population that his business decision had rendered. And so we're interested in trying in this uh, PTGPO group trying to put recommendations in place that would be helpful for provincial governments, but also for the federal government. Next slide, please. From an individual institution standpoint, they were without question informed a precious few weeks before the first impact was felt. They did have some lead time to develop contingency plans and to adjust the care services as may be needed. Uh, but then a lot of work is involved by a lot of people. And certainly uh, this brought out uh, a great deal of work from an ethics framework as well. It's also led to some significant changes in, in medication systems and how they're operated within the healthcare system as a whole. And also they've identified uh, um, the successful or appropriate therapeutic alternatives for their respective care settings. And of course, the individual institutions have been very active in networking uh, amongst themselves through a couple of key channels. One is to the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists uh, um, PSN network on uh, drug shortages. Uh, second is through local or, or provincial shared services organizations where they're engaged in pharmaceutical activities. And certainly with their national group purchasing organizations. There's been a tremendous amount of collaboration and sharing on all three fronts. And while one might say that's inefficient, it's actually proving to be quite effective. Mostly because if you try something, you post it, and you discover that somebody else is heading down the same path of trying to understand something, it becomes confirming when you see that your thinking was in, in a good direction, when you see it pop up a couple different times and other people are supporting it. Next slide, please. So where are we for next steps? Well, first off, we have to develop some recommendations for change so that we can mitigate such an impact in the future. Uh, ideas along this front at the present time are looking at policy changes, both provincially and federally, uh, contracting practice changes, and identification of key product rosters for Canada, and also looking at building an emergency response kind of construct not unlike we did for H1N1 pandemic planning. There are several other ideas, but these seem to be the, uh, the large ones that are and the most significant ones coming forward. I think as well, looking forward, hospitals have uh, managed to achieve some things in the medication systems as a function of this issue, which have been longstanding challenges. And now we've had a, a Sentinel event to help drive it. Um, my hope would be that our hospitals and our healthcare system as a whole would be able to make these changes, these constructive changes, permanent. And of course, ultimately, then increase the, the safety of the system as required by Accreditation Canada. Next slide, please. So my final conclusion, this uh, current situation has been developing for, for 25, 30 years and more. Uh, there are several parties and practices that have contributed, government policy, for purchasing practices, and the fact that we have a publicly funded system that interfaces with a free market enterprise uh, commercial system uh, by default. We've had great collaboration occurring uh, by all governments to make drug available and also to manage the current supplies locally. It's important to understand this is a game changer and we should expect new policies and practices uh, to come forward, uh, or come forward rather, in terms of how we operate our medication system and, and that it will come forward in a collaborative approach involving governments, group purchasing, and uh, institutions. So with, it, with that, I'd be happy to turn uh, the conversation over to Marcel. And our final picture here is uh, we do have a road ahead of us. There is light at the end of the tunnel, and there will be good that comes from this, but the journey is still long. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, the impact that we felt here at the Stollery Children's Hospital. And um, I put this uh, I put this slide up. Um, we have a problem because I remember when we heard about this, we were all all of our leadership group was about to go to a meeting, and right before we went to a, one of our regularly scheduled meetings, we pulled up this email and kind of read it quickly. And I think a lot of us read it and thought, "Well, this can't be right." Followed from this is going to be incredible, um, and uh, now here we are in the middle of it. So I, I just want to talk about um, how our organizational structure looks regarding purchasing, so that you can understand um, how it's working here for us. And I want to talk about the communication flow from um, the larger department to the individual sites, um, and how uh, we focused uh, at our site on. Uh, particularly identifying um, strategies for reducing waste and um, alternatives, as well as communicating um, the plan to everybody. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're planning to measure if it's working or not. So I also thought it might be important uh, for you to know who we are to put this into some context. Uh, the story is a children's hospital within a larger campus of institutions that are all connected by a bunch of headways and hallways. Um, the uh, Heart Institute here is uh, 106 beds. Uh, the Alberta, University of Alberta Hospital is 589 beds and the salary is 146 beds. We have one central pharmacy and our drug distribution is through a combination of automated dispensing cabinets, some unit dosing, we have a SIVA program, and um, also obviously some specific expensive. So um, one of the first questions that we had at our first meeting was after we found out this was real was how are we going to know what's going on and we felt that um, as the whole group talked that communication was the most important thing. We, certainly from our pharmacy department's uh, perspective um, communication from our group purchasing uh, provincial purchasing group to our individual sites we thought to be very important, but then we didn't think, a lot of us who are um, not involved in uh, central purchasing or DUE, but our um, clinicians, thought that there was going to be an important role for us in communicating with our frontline staff as well. So this is how our, um, this is what a, uh, our organizational structure for purchasing looks like um, and how it's worked in, in light of the shortages. Our central purchasing um, group is a purchasing group for our whole province, which is now all one health region. So they receive info uh, from Sandoz and Health Pro and HPSM and Health Canada and um, provide some directions to the site um, on how to move stock around. We've had some commitment from everyone to move stock around in the province. Um, and then as well, they've been very helpful in trying to get uh, there's alternate vendors communicating that kind of information to our individual purchasers because obviously within the entire province there are, are very different needs in terms of uh, particular medications from large tertiary care sites like ours to um, you know, eight bed hospitals in rural Alberta. So uh, from there uh, our local pharmacy purchasing is providing information constantly uh, regarding inventory levels on drugs that are affected by shortages. Um, and then uh, also moving stock around as they need to. Our therapeutics group, our, our clinical group, and our DUEDI group has been involved um, whenever there's discussions about alternatives or um, how we should be managing or prioritizing patients, um, looking at um, different suppliers. As was mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of us are talking to a lot of other people all of the time on our, on our different listservs. So if there are clinical issues that are involving drugs on the shortest list, then we're having conversations about that. Um, and then uh, our clinical groups, larger clinical groups are involved in identifying developing waste minimization strategies uh, at the local sites and communicating and educating. And I'll just mention there is kind of a two-layer two process here. There, there is this work that's going on 
on a provincial level um, initially and then locally at the sites we also have some groups that you'll see later. We have a drug shortage emergency operating center also in place uh, from a provincial level. Um, its role is to coordinate the efforts between the groups kind of on an urgent basis that has representation from central purchasing, uh, procurement, um, our pharmacy therapeutics group, our communications group, our physicians groups, as well as all of our external groups that were mentioned earlier. And the, um, the EOC is, has the VP of Pharmacy Services, the medical director from Pharmacy Services as well on that committee, so more high level level groups initially. Um, so that's kind of the communication flow. Um, central purchasing receives info from multiple sources. All of these people are working together to find some store strategy and then communicating to our individual hospitals about stock status um, and then that to the front line staff. Um, so I'll just uh, continue on. Our, our provincial working groups, um, it's important to note, are interdisciplinary and also because we have uh, purchasing requirements from across the province, we have representation from across the province. And because of the natures of the, of the drugs that have been involved um, from a clinical importance point of view, critical care and anesthesia and infectious diseases, um, or have been involved. Um, the roles of this group has been to develop educational material, um, also identify if our, uh, you know, our clinical tools like our parental manual monographs uh, or our smart pump libraries need to be updated, identifying those issues and then getting that information to the people who are involved in those uh, types of activities at the individual site level. We also have some medication postings that we're using to help communicate um, uh, to uh, frontline staff as well. Um, so we have some centralized provincial communication strategies that involve uh, a website that all of our staff throughout the province can access. And I'll show you a little picture of that in a second, as well as our medication postings, which are little posters that we had before um, that we also used for drug shortages or if there was back orders or if there was a labeling change or if a product was no longer available, those kinds of things. As well, I think everybody in the world now <laughs> is using email fanouts for everything. Um, this is actually, this is a, this website was just updated re recently as well. So you can click on information about specific agents um, and it's updated, I think, uh, every couple of days even. Um, so you can retrieve medication postings if you want, if there's any communication that's gone out officially that's located on this website as well. And um, I put this disclaimer on it because I was asked to. Um, we also have this medication posting that goes up. They all look the same uh, in terms of uh, the color and the, and the format. And then on the side you can see there's a rationale. The very last one is uh, drug shortage, so it's been very highly used lately. Um, so what I wanted to focus on, though, has been, um, you know, on our, from a frontline staff perspective, from an impact on the patient at the bedside perspective, how are we attempting to manage um, how that's going to work in our facility? And considering the allocation status of a lot of these products, how can we try and make sure that we are making our allocation every week and um, ensuring that we're conserving drugs for as long as possible for as many patients in the future as we can. Um, and, you know, having this information that comes uh, from a pro central provincial group um, to um, to us all at the front line, a lot of us thought that it would be a good idea for us to kind of get together and talk about how this is going to imp impact each and every one of us and all of our uh, teams and our patients. So the first group to pop up was actually an intensive care committee that um, one of the anesthesiologists was very keen to get going. And uh, initially it was just a couple of intensivists and an anesthesiologist and one of the pharmacists from our intensive care unit. Um, and we also, um, shortly after that, the 
pediatric wards also decided that um, you know they wanted to be make sure that we had good communication between the wards and the intensive care in terms of what they were going to be doing and we wanted to know how we could try and make this work on the wards as well. So the intensive care committee focused on medications where we saw less than two weeks supply, there was no alternative suppliers and there were workhorse medications which at the time um, we first looked, started looking at this was analgesic sedatives, neuromuscular blockers, vasopressors, antiarrhythmics and anti-seizure medication. They also wanted to make sure that this was not um, a group of people getting in a room and telling everyone that one size was going to fit all, all of the time for every patient, but rather that we could facilitate a discussion about what, when was it rational um, to do what. And there was a few basic principles that came out of there. One was that one of the major strategies for us to preserve stock would be to use oral medications when possible, and then how can we minimize use by mixing minimal amounts in pediatrics. Um, many of the product sizes we have aren't really necessarily always appropriate for patient size, so a lot of drugs can potentially be wasted. In addition, um, where possible, we wanted to think about what alternatives there were out there and whether those were rational and safe and um, as good as the drugs that we like to use. They came up with some criteria and examples of when uh, to use certain agents, and they also decided amongst themselves that they were going to restrict practitioners who could order certain medications within their own groups. So they put out a little uh, narrative of um, how they thought they should handle situations where they were using a lot of their drugs, and sedation and analgesia was one of those uh, protocols that they came up with. Um, fairly straightforward and fairly non-intensive, uh, but um, seems they believe it is working quite well for them. Our wards committee um, got together when, the, like I said, when the intensive care committee started to get together, um, and we wanted to stay in close communication with this group. So we actually um, participate. Two of the members of each committee participate in the other committee, so that we can stay on top of things and communicate with each other. Um, our major strategy on the ward right now is, has been to look at using oral dosage forms whenever possible. And we realized that um, the way that we that, that would work in our hospital um, was to make sure that we engaged our frontline nursing staff and our prescribers and our residents um, as often and uh, as much as possible. Um, so initially we developed a cheat sheet as a strategy for communication and that cheat sheet is being placed in the front of every chart um, on every admission package and it just has some drugs that are affected and what we're, we would like people to consider um, if that is appropriate for their patients. The thing that I think has been most successful for us is that we involve all of our um, clinical pharmacists on the ward on the wards as well as all of the physicians that were on our committee and we started just hitting the streets and hitting every ward nursing meeting and all of the divisional meetings for the physician groups as well as the uh, nursing management meetings, the uh, academic half days for the pediatric residents. And all we did was go and take five or ten minutes of their time, tell them what was happening, tell them why we needed this, um, their help to make this um, successful. And um, we are committed to doing that on a uh, at least monthly basis from here on in. Um, in addition, one of the things we wanted to know was, you know, is this going to work for us or is this going to be enough? Do we need to rethink about how we're communicating this and whether we're meeting our targets for allocation? Um, and our, we have automated dispensing cabinets in all of our PEDS units and uh, in particular, antiemetics and opioids were identified as drugs that were very high use relative to the other medications that, I, that we felt often could be given orally. So we're able to retrieve monthly reports and um, we're planning to, I'm sad to say that I didn't have time to get all this information together and put it on a nice pretty graph, but it appears that we're doing quite well and we're planning to use this information when we return to the nursing staff in particular. Um, to provide some positive reinforcement that they are doing a good job in selecting the pa those patients that were uh, appropriate for oral drugs. So I also was asked, you know, can you talk about whether or not there was that there's been a big impact on patients? And um, so far, no, there has not been a big impact on patients at our site. 
Um, we've had no canceled surgeries or procedures due to the sort of shortages. Um, so far, most of the impact has been fairly has been clinically insignificant um, impact, but maybe you know to patients maybe a little uh, maybe a little bit of an inconvenience. An example of that would be you know in the prior to the shortage, if we had a patient that was receiving an antiemetic for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, for example, and they had a central line, we might have just given them that drug while they were asleep at night and not um, and tried not to wake them up while we were doing it, but you know. Now that just means that we're maybe waking a, a child up for five minutes, giving them a tablet and a drink of water, and putting them back to sleep. So um, that's, I mean, for the most part, been the extent of the type of uh, impact on patients. Um, the PICU uh, has been, you know, very uh, aware of the potential problems they could have with switching to PO, but they have actually had no real major changes that they've noted in patient comfort or increased adverse events, but they have, they do believe that they've shown a decrease in medication um, wastage and maybe a little bit of a decrease in use of uh, certain medications. Uh, um, and all that they've really considered is uh, what they normally would do in converting patients to oral medications, uh, looking at whether that's possible a little bit sooner in the game. Now impact on staff has been a bit of a different story. Um, this has been, you know, increased workload for a lot of a lot of different people. Um, there's been increased meetings to plan communication, increased meetings to make treatment pathways, um, time to research alternate strategies, more meetings to develop communication strategies. There's been workload on, you know, places like our IV rooms if we're decanting vials to smaller sizes, and all the work that has to go in looking at whether that's possible and whether that. Uh, safe and, and removing and adding uh, medications to Pixis machines and developing and re analyzing reports and I can't emphasize the number of emails that um, we get regularly um, regarding shortages because we need to be able to communicate in a timely fashion so we've re you know there's a lot of work that goes into emails emails and more emails so with that I would like to pass it over to Reggie to see um, how things are going at Geo. I thought when you said good picture, good, I thought you meant good slides. Anyway, uh, I'll go over the, the few perspective and experience. Uh, also, what you're gonna, I'm going to provide to you. Sorry, I'm trying to change my slide now. Is uh, we had the opportunity to have a MedBuy Pharmacy Committee meeting earlier this week, and we spent a full day talking about the drug shortage. So some of the information might be coming from some of the uh, experience of the other director of pharmacy across the MedBuy collaboration group uh, to, um, to explain how they, they survive or how they manage the drug shortage as well. So I'll give you uh, the external and internal communication overview, uh, the bad, the good, and the ugly, and I'll give you a conclusion. So communication has been a major problem in this crisis. As, as we heard today, uh, drug shortage is something that's the routine for pharmacy or pharmacy department. However, this, this, the level of drug shortage has been much higher. So now all these senior administrators needed to get involved. So as we were getting a triplicate copy of the email from Delin, uh, from internal, external, it was just, it's just crazy. But what has been stabilized as we get a week later at the conference with our local health integrated network, and we get const many emails per week. We get emails from Baxter and us uh, regularly about the micronutrient shortage. Uh, we get uh, t weekly teleconference and excellent email from MedBuy, who, by the way, has made it much easier for us to go through this crisis, to go into our buying groups. And we also have weekly teleconference and email from our regional director of pharmacy. And on top of this, we have uh, uh, pharmacy specialty North network from the Kansas Society of Pharmacists, pharmacists that gave us information about drug shortage. So uh, Marcel was mentioning that we get email overload. This is true. It is crazy how many information and repetition of emails that we get. Uh, we're not as centralized as Alberta is, so that that on its own creates some problems. Internally, uh, it's uh, the the day after the uh, announcement of this drug shortage, we had a pharmacy and therapeutics committee, and to be able to deal with the crisis, uh, we agreed that I would link 
to the most uh, senior physician that the drug is mostly used to deal with the uh, strategy to mitigate the drug shortage. So, uh, so if it was an antibiotics, I will deal with infectious disease physician and come out with recommendation. This way, it allows us to um, to be able to speed up the process without asking permission from left, right, and center. So to date, I had uh, dealing with uh, infectious disease, um, uh, dealing with anesthesia, of course, gastroenterology, and also some emergency pharmacy, emergency physicians. Um, so this is really the internal communication to get the decision made. This is on the left of the uh, slides. What we communicate out, again, we had the communication strategy, the discussions, and, it, and everybody is very busy, and it's not email, but email. Uh, basically, we have decided that a fine out of email going to physician, nurses, and operation directors, manager, would be sufficient. Uh, we do a unit uh, drug shortage poster, and we also have a posting on the intranet, and um, so this is the communication structure for outside the pharmacy. Within the pharmacy, of course, we have a drug shortage uh, regrouping once a week to figure out how we're going to address the issues and who needs to do what. So as you can see, a fair bit of work and, and discussion takes place. This is a, a copy of our uh, drug shortage alert posters. It's divided in three sections. One section is we, don't, we just don't have it. Leave us alone. Don't ask questions. This is the red section. The yellow one is there's been some restriction of the use of some of these products, or we are concerned that we might be running short. And the green one are conserved, but right now our supply is, 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 is coming, so just think about it before you waste any of this. Uh, it's been quite popular, and this is very practical. It's posted in all the med rooms, and it's sent by email to all the physicians. And by the way, since this new crisis, physicians are telling me that they read my email, so I'm all excited now, because I don't think they were reading them before. So the bad, uh, what we had to do uh, very early on, uh, we had gone through past experience with the tritomycin drug shortage, and we were quite concerned for our neonates and some specific indication. So we came up with new antibody guidelines with the, for the use of jatamycin, uh, tobramycin and clidamycin, to make sure that we will conserve these drugs. And at the beginning of the crisis, we didn't know how much supplies would be coming back into us. So these communication, these antibody guidelines came out very quickly. But what we did, it went against some of our basic principle of antibiotic stewardship. So we saw a significant increase in the, in the utilization of ceftriaxone, for example. And we're concerned that we may increase the risk of uh, resistance with the use of uh, third generation cephalosporin. So to me, uh, it's kind of a good thing that we were able to change the practice quickly, but we're concerned. Uh, as an example, the surgeon, we were fighting with them not to use ceftriaxone for surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. And then, because we want to reserve uh, gentamicin for, for real infection, then we allow them to do this. And now they're all happy, but we're not quite happy. So to me, it's a bit bad. From other institutions, some of the bad is the fact that physicians had to use all older drugs which they are not familiar with. Like procainamide is a good example. Almost never used, but because of the drug shortage, it's some institutions had to go to other drugs which the physician is familiar may increase the risk of medication errors. Other bad that, that, that we had to deal with, uh, within the LIN, not within CHIO, we had some issue within CHIO, is the uh, access to drug in the community. Uh, palliative care, uh, palliative care has been provided to patients outside the hospital within our local health and network have problem getting hydromorphone HP or hydromorphone. So patients were about to be readmitted to the hospital that could be taken care of at home because of the drug shortage. So we had to work to make sure that the, the community health agency or the, the, the drug store, the pharmacy that were providing home care to these patients had access to these drugs. Uh, the same thing for dental services. We're using midazolam. So that has some issue within the, the community. Uh, I'm talking about the uh, Champlain Lynn, but also within the all community, I believe. Um, here at CHIO, what we had to deal with is uh, vitamin K. Vitamin K, we had a group of patients that were taking vitamin K PO, but using the injectable product. So we'll break out the ampoules and put it in the valve, and they would take this and drink this because vitamin K is not available as a tablet commercially available. So we switched them to SAP because you couldn't get access to preserve the vitamin K, which allowed us to uh, actually have like 30 weeks supplies of vitamin K now because uh, I switched all my patients that were on the injectable PO to the PO that's a special access program. 
which has a significant impact on the cost of the drug for the patients because uh, we, we charge them at this point how much it costs and goes from I think $200 a week or something like this. And we have the same issue with a patient who uh, was admitted to GU and C's for about three months, and I'm not kidding, and she was on high, high dose of phenobarbital, and to come up with the, the volume that was acceptable, we were using the injectable, 120 milligrams per ml, PO. And uh, I got the phone call from neurologists on a Friday afternoon, always Friday afternoon, the patient that needs to be admitted if we don't supply some drugs from Chio Pharmacy, which we did. So that's to me another bad effect that community has had difficulty to have access to, to uh, these drugs, but we've been able to, in this example, manage this so far. The other bad is we keep crying wolf. Like the situation is very fluid. One day we don't get our shipment, then we have to uh, call around, get the drugs from somewhere else, and, and then the next day we get our shipment. So we, we feel that uh, we're always in a crying wolf situation, but then there's no wolf there. So it's very embarrassing. And we had this ex example uh, in two situations with ternacinic acid and potamine at CHIO that I was getting very critical. And as you would understand that these drugs need to be on site if we need them. That's not the point that we can send someone to uh, get them. So it created a lot of anxiety. Uh, but we were fine. We also had the, to put aside our look-alike uh, concept because of getting access to some drugs. Uh, we sometimes go out of our med buy contract to buy some drugs because the, um, the, the vials from it look too much alike. Well, we have to let go of that patient safety approach of it because now we're more concerned with getting the drug, not if it looks like another drug. So it's another thing that uh, increases our, our level of anxiety. We have changed formulation. An example is ciprofloxacin. It used to come as, an, as a, a vial. Now we have a, a bag. So. Uh, we also had to change formulation of some, we had to do some pre-filled syringe of some drugs to try to preserve. And ketamine, we had to do this at, uh, at our hospital. I know a lot of the other hospitals did the midazolam and did the fentanyl as well, but us, we did the ketamine. We also had an issue with the expiry date uh, of drugs. Uh, there's a different set of standards for the expiry date of drugs, because there's stability from a chemistry point of view, and there's stability from a, a bacteriological point of view, which is called the USP 797 standard, which is an American standard. So there's been a lot of discussion, which standard should we follow for the stability of the drugs when it's been reconstituted and ready to be administered. So it has created a lot of uh, discrepancy. And I think there's pharmacists on the line they will understand what I'm talking about. And in the mitigation risk, I'll talk about manufacturer expiry date as well. But how do we do? with drugs that are about to expire so that we can get new drugs. And actually, this is, uh, there's an approach now, but that was something that at the beginning was quite significant concern. The good uh, that came out of this crisis is that uh, within Ontario, in a way, we have an ethical framework for rationing of drugs and also for sharing. So, and it's been quite good, and actually we shared it with our physician team, and they're quite open with this. And it has made them realize that, that open communication is quite critical. We have had extremely good interprofessional collaborations. Uh, they, um, I'm telling you, the physician now read my email. It's about drug shortage. We have seen some waste reduction, uh, things that were done that need, did not need to be done. Uh, for example, a patient on, a, on an opioid infusion, some of the nurse at every shift would prepare a syringe of naloxone to put at the patient's bedside to be ready to administer and waste it. Well, naloxone is an ours kind of a drug that's on the short list to be a, might be going on back order. So they themselves realize they don't need to do this on a regular basis. So we've seen it in a different, different aspect of care. Marcel talked about the conversion from IV to PO, which should be done more frequently. In pediatrics, sometimes, uh, example, clindamycin is not easy to do because clindamycin doesn't taste very good, but if it's possible to do, it's being done as mo more and more. In some way, by having pharmacy prepare some pre-filled syringe, it basically um, provided a concept as a ready to use a drug as a point of care. So it's another bad thing altogether. And from our med by group pharmacy discussion, the question now that we've done this for a while, and we've done ketamine at CHIO, but some other hospitals have done fentanyl and midazolam, how can we go back and take it away from them? Because they really like it, so the nurse, the nurse really loved it, I guess. One of the issues with preload syringes is that it highlighted the fact that pharmacy needs to make them, and I'll probably highlight this at the end, 
and the limiting stability and efficient control measures should be in place. I'll talk to you about some of the concern we have had with pre-filled syringe as well. So it's good, but it's not always good. The ugly, uh, the pharmacy buyer fatigue, uh, constant over time to deal uh, from one day to another. We don't know how much drug we've got in our shipment. So again, we go from the crying wolf situation to uh, we're fine for now, we're fine for now. So it's just a constant, constant uh, crisis mode. And we had to look at alternate source of supply for drugs, and we don't have contracts, so the cost of some drugs, I remember Odensetron cost me probably three times what it usually cost me to get some Odensetron. So not at CHEO, I'm telling you right away, but in some other institution within the MedBuy group, so the senior admin address the staff fatigue in the pharmacy by providing them a weekly lunch as a recognition of uh, the pharmacy contribution during this crisis. Everybody uh, um, contributes to uh, improving the, or making sure the drugs are there. So hint, hint, Tracy. Uh, oh, there's also some uh, uh, massage therapists offered to some of the pharmacy staff in some institutions. So some hospitals have looked at, tried to decrease the stress fatigue or the staff fatigue into uh, some of the institutions. Medication errors. At you, we have had not had any medication error related to the drug shortage. But from the group discussion of MedBuy, they have some cases they wanted to present. One of them was a use of etacrinic acid instead of ferrosamide. And uh, basically, the, the dose are not correct, and the patient ended up having hyponatremia. Anyway, I them having some consequence because the physician thought that ferrosamide was not available. It turns out it was available. So in some way, by creating this list of drugs that we are preserving, some physicians think it's not available and they use drugs they are less familiar, which created some problems with the patients. Um, they had another, another two again, and where the uh, Ketorolac is on the short list as well. It was no longer available. And the uh, nurse was not familiar with the monitoring of it, and the patient required some naloxone administration uh, because uh, because they, they were not used to give IV push morphine in the emergency department. They used Keterodac for that. So, so again, it's, it's something that you have to be careful when you switch therapeutic approach all suddenly for many drugs. And again, the issue of preloading syringe in the patient's bedside is also another thing that uh, could increase the risk of error if it's not labeled properly. The risk mitigation approach. So the OR group came up with guidelines, and we have re looked at their kits that they get on a regular basis to reduce the waste and also to, uh, to focus their, their, um, their therapy so that we can preserve some drugs for the patient that really needs it. We've done it for antibiotics. We also have done it with micronutrients with some of the um, trace element and vitamins. We also have the sharing agreements uh, within our LIN and going back to the ethical framework. And it's very well structured, organized. We have uh, we share within the region first, with across LIN and outside of province next. The concept behind this is no patient should suffer from this drug shortage. If you have it, you share it. Kind of difficult at some point. The thing that uh, GU has been lucky is the um, is the issue about uh, minimum site on site supply. As part of our flu pandemic plan, we had planned to keep high, uh, high quantity of midazolam, fentanyl, and, um, and morphine. Therefore, when the drug shortage came in, we were fine. We had uh, enough to, to deal with the flu pandemic, and our flu pandemic uh, plan had these drugs in, on it. So I guess it's making us looking also how many drugs should we have on site, because if you only order based on the location, based on the last year usage as well. Uh, it might create some problems. So the whole concept of, of flu pandemic supply or flu pandemic plan, looking at your drug supply, will be revived in some way, looking at other type of, uh, of emergency situations. Again, I talked about macronutrient, decreasing the dose of vitamin and TPN. Uh, we also got through our buying group uh, a way to prioritize. The, the, um, uh, the American, American Society of Parenteral Nutrition states that if you have to prioritize uh, macronutrients, you have to give the macronutrients to neonates. So through a, a consultation process of the director of pharmacy at MedBuy, we all agree that if we go to a situation that is, we're going to be based on allocation, so the institution to have neonatal care, be the first one that will be allowed to get some of these macronutrients to be able to get to the neonates. So we're not quite there yet, but at least we have agreement that we have uh, to treat our babies first. Uh, the vitamin K, uh, you talk about the vitamin K that I switched from the injectable PU to 
giving the, the oral PO uh, as well. We save a lot of vitamin K like this. There is mitigation to the communication structure. As I mentioned earlier, the communication in the beginning was very chaotic and it still is in some point. But I have to tell some of my senior staff, because I was getting an email from my CEO, my VP, Tracy Rong, which is uh, from Quality. I was getting an email internally from many people. So I basically said, I'm getting these emails. You don't need to copy me two or three times on the same email. So now we have a better structure of our communications, both internally with our buying group. And I feel to me that's working well is the Canadian Society, TSN, and, and our buying group because they are more in direct contact with the, um, with, the, with the providers or the manufacturers. We don't have the luxury of Alberta of having one group for the whole province, but anyway. So that, that makes a, a facilitate our work significantly. Uh, it's important that the pharmacy needs to remain in control of the situation. So sometimes we see, uh, and I would be very uh, candid, some administrator wants to take over the control, but they don't understand the situation. We need to be in control, both at the strategic level and also the unit-based level. Because I had some nurses that came up with some idea to reduce weights, but they were not meeting infection control standard, and they were not meeting, for not it was improper labeling of the drugs or um, labeling of the drugs or uh, Okay, that's a good, the, the two key things I remember. So I have to tell them, no, you cannot do it in this situation. In other situation, you could do it, but we need to remain in control and be consistent in our approach. Other risk mitigation that are taking place is that the government is looking at the increasing expiry date of some of the lot number of drugs that are about to expire that are in a short supply. Um, some institution, uh, I haven't had to do this here, have agreed to extend the, the expiry of some drugs knowing they cannot get access to, to other drugs on their own. But we're asking it, and it's, it could be done, I'm not, I'm not losing sleep over this, but the point is we want to make sure that becomes a corporate or a national decision to extend the expiry date. Because if the drug is expired by one or two days, it's not going to be exploding and not be good anymore. And again, our sharing agreement has been very good. So in conclusion, and this is a picture of one of our shipments, there was nothing in it, uh, I think it was six, 30, 39 items. We need to be careful and when we do the practice changes and we must be, have a coordinated, coordinated approach to make sure that it's safe for our patient. And to date, no of our, none of our patients have suffered from this uh, drug shortage. Thank you. Well, hi there everybody, it's Tracy. And I have to say a great big wow and thank you to our three presenters for giving that really comprehensive um, outline of this uh, interesting situation. And um, I, I certainly have appreciated both uh, Richard uh, setting the stage and I learned a lot just uh, not really understanding sort of uh, the, the multiple factors that have led us to this uh, point where we are right now, and then as well as Marcel and Regis's perspectives from um, within the children's hospitals that are, uh, are being touched by this. Uh, at this point, um, it's our opportunity to open up the, the floor for questions. Lisa, can I get you to just explain to people how to do that? Uh, certainly. So you can either raise your hand um, in your control panel and I will try to unmute your line, or um, you can type your question into the control panel into the question box. Currently, I have uh, I have no questions. Um, uh, well, I have one question sitting right beside me, Elaine Orbine. Thanks, Lisa. And I raised my hand only I didn't have to do it on the uh, on the screen. Um, I too want to say wow, uh, Richard and Marcel and uh, Richard, uh, absolutely outstanding presentation. Um, I think you know I, if I could just ask, I think. I'd like to focus in on the benefits and, and just, just make a, a couple of comments. I think we have to congratulate, in particular, the Stollery and Chio. That's just something that's very evident to me. On when you, when you say that none of our patients, none of our infants or children and youth have suffered as a result, I think that comes from the tremendous care popping into immediate action and doing what needed to be done as described in the presentations today, that's the reason that the outcome around patient impact has been excellent. And I, I really want to, uh, I, I want to recognize that. And I also have no doubt that that is a similar situation across all of our, across our continuum of care um, uh, in, in the country. Um, 
I, I also think, you know, the that conversion from IV to oral that, that both uh, Marcel and Regis, you commented on, I think that's maybe um, a positive, not just in terms of no harm to patient during this crisis, but longer term, it, it could be a, an impact on practice change um, that I think might be very positive from a longer term uh, perspective. Um, I think it's important, you know, to recognize MedBuy's role in uh, a crisis like this, and um, and I, I want to add um, add the importance of, of that role, uh, and that is key national support. And also, I know from February seventh, when MedBuy, uh, Sigma Sante, and HealthPro were notified by Sandos. Um, I certainly know that MedBuy has kept their finger on the pulse of this from, from starters. And um, communication, I, I think that's another very key learning that has come from our presentations today. And again, no impact on patients, huge impact on staff, time, all of, all of the issues identified, but again, we needed to jump into crisis mode and react, and we did. So I, 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 I certainly understand the challenges, but I do want to commend our two hospitals um, and MedBuy for for the um, for the work and reaction uh, since since the crisis. So I do have a question here from Laurel. I don't know if anybody can actually answer this one, but. Uh, when will Sandoz be back uh, to fully up and running, and what is the time frame? It's Richard here. I, I can try and answer that. I just want to make sure you can hear me all. Yeah, okay. we can hear you. Okay. Um, just before I jump into that, uh, Elaine, to your your uh, comments uh, about the work that's under uh, that has occurred today. Thank you very much. It's uh, uh, but I also wanted to commend CAF C as well because prior uh, to um, the group purchasing organization's notes going to the deputy minister of, of health federally. Um, we had been keeping CAFC fully abreast because of the relationship and the close connection that we have. And Elaine uh, took the opportunity to write a letter herself reflecting similar recommendations. And I, I think it was uh, no accident that the kinds of things that have happened at Health Canada with the speed in which they've come about has also been uh, directly impacted by CAFC's role at that table too. So going back to the, the question at hand, um, in, in the way the uh, remediation process has to work is that the, the FDA works very closely with uh, the company in hand through the remediation process. Um, and they have to go back through and ad identify all the elements that were identified in the citation, uh, readjust their processes and protocols, and then literally produce three production runs. Uh, the size of those production runs is not known, but they have to produce three production runs in order to validate that in fact the uh, remediation is now permanently in place and is effective. Uh, the, what I am aware is that the first production run in such an exercise um, is normally uh, discarded as uh, inventory uh, that comes out of that production run, but the other two can be sold assuming final approval by the FDA. The unfortunate thing is that this needs to be done by SKU um, because each production run packages in a specific format. Um, and if for the SKUs involved from the FDA circumstance, uh, it's a small list, it's a, uh, I, I forget the exact number, but it's uh, half a dozen or so, maybe as many as 10 SKUs. Um, but it has to be done for each. And so we're anticipating that the regular production run, the testing, uh, the validation that remediation has actually worked um, it will probably take between 12 and 18 months from the initial citation date, which means we're looking well into 2013. Then once that all comes back online, Health Canada still has to make their own determinations um, to be sure that the production capacity is meeting Health Canada requirements. And um, that can obviously be undertaken in parallel uh, with the FDA's interests, but uh, there's many more SKUs involved in Canada, so we would anticipate a similar window of time. 
And then the final piece of the exercise is once everything is, is all signed off on by the respective regulatory authorities, is the, the need to rebuild inventory holding levels across the country. Now, it's probably reasonable to, to assume our former inventory holding levels at all the uh, pharmacies will be probably a good deal higher than they were previously. And, uh, and so restocking of inventory may be quite a different exercise than what was initially anticipated. So my best guess is we're looking at somewhere around the middle of 2013 to the end of 2013 before we stand a chance of having most things back online. The other thing to keep in mind with all of this is that it isn't just Sandoz. This has had a huge ripple effect on many other suppliers because we've all resorted to other sources of supply where ones were available. And um, we put pressure on their production systems too. In addition to that, the normal back order level rate uh, um, still has to be addressed. And we're actually in the throes right now of another one with uh, pre-filled syringes for resuscitation drugs. And that it has nothing to do with Sandoz, but it's a very real circumstance that uh, is, is ripping all of us across the country right now from our emergency medical services back into our crash carts and institutions and the emergency departments, because it's all pre-filled syringes. Thanks for that, Richard. I think that that's uh, certainly uh, laid the cards out pretty easily for us to appreciate the complexity of bringing this one back into uh, into what we might have considered our, our, our normal. Um, a question that I have perhaps for Marcel and for Regis is, um, I, although it, it may have touched our pediatric patients to date um, relatively minimally, um, has there has there been any feedback from families in your institutions around the uh, availability of drugs and, and any levels of discontent? Um, Hello. I, I could respond. A tough to question that. or an easy one? I, no, I was politely waiting for Reggie to answer. Uh, I, I was doing the same, which is unusual for me. But anyway. <laughs> Um, I, I, could, I can speak to uh, my, in my own practice. I think that when we found out about this, obviously um, a number of drugs that are on there are quite important for oncology patients, particularly supportive care med, and in particular nausea and vomiting and uh, pain are two issues that we need to address regularly. So I think that um, we, uh, I mean, our, we first started, made sure that we communicated well with our um, nursing and physician staff to let them know exactly what was going on and exactly how we thought we should be managing it. And then um, we have a number of posters up on the ward where we, uh, that we've clearly um, laid out the situation for parents and they were actually, they've actually been extremely helpful um, in recognizing, uh, you know, when, when we have patients, if, when, when their children are, can be the children that can be taking oral medications because they're not growing up or they have an uh, enteral route that's available, they've been very um, receptive to that. And also our, um, there's been communication from, um, uh, I think it was, it's the, uh, I don't know who, what the, who, who exactly it came from, but it's our very senior administration, a letter to all patients just explaining that, um, you know, to date, people require intravenous medications that are on that list. They have been getting them and they will continue to get them as long as we have them, but that we, you know, we're trying to implement strategies to reduce our usage for those people who don't require them. Regis, did you want to add anything? So, well, except for the family that had to switch the uh, vitamin K to an oral form that had to pay more money and um, I was saying that's the only one has discontent. The one with the phenobarbital example, uh, we ended up providing it very smoothly, very quickly. The mother it was from, uh, I think, an hour and a half drive from here. So uh, it was an uh, inconvenience for them, but they were, uh, I think they were happy we were taking care of them. Uh, we did not, uh, it was not their problem, it was our problem, meaning that uh, we didn't get the burden of finding, trying to find a solution we didn't get the burden on the family, we took over the problem. So I would say no, except for these two families. I, certainly I, it, it speaks to the, uh, the role, the leadership that the uh, hospital pharmacies play in not only interacting with the, the um, providers, but certainly with the uh, families too. And I'm sure that that's appreciated. 
Uh, Lisa, any other questions? Yeah, so I have a question for Regis and Marcel. So how have you handled uh, the pre-printed order sets in terms of the daily changes that are being experienced with the drugs? And do you use automatic substitutions? Uh, abandon the drug portions of the order set, etc. I can answer this. We have uh, our, our system for preprinted orders is online, so we don't uh, encourage people to print the preprinted order in advance. They go in our intranet and they print a copy and they use it there. So, uh, and we did make some changes to some preprinted order. I don't, I just don't recall. Very early we did. I think we removed gentamicin for febrile neutropenia patients. Or I knew we did some changes, but we because they are online, we can change and change them very very quickly. So it was. Uh, a, an easy fix, and we've done this to make sure that we maintain our permanent order always up to date. Um, I can say that we don't have a, a online order entry, and we don't have our um, preprints um, online, and that's been that is something that we're trying to figure out how to deal with, um, kind of on a weekly basis. Some of them are coming up. Um, one way that we have been dealing with. Um, uh, I mean, to be fair, a lot of the drugs that are on here um, may have already been ordered in a, say, IV and PO fashion, and the prescriber has to pick from the two, or they're ordered as IV or PO if the dosing is the same for them. So some of that has been, uh, well, that hasn't been so much of an issue, but I, one example is our, um, that's come up recently has been our uh, morphine infusion preprints, and the fact that we, um, we use the same bag size that a lot of kids probably end up wasting a fair amount of it post-op, for example. So we're trying to figure out the um, process for uh, pending pre-printed orders in our organization is a little more lengthy, so we're trying to, we, that is something we're struggling with. We haven't figured that out either. I just wondering, is there anybody else online uh, out there that is, is experiencing things any differently or has any other uh, um, comments to add? Just a moment, uh, there was two questions, one of them about automatic uh, substitutions. Uh, I forgot to answer that question. Uh, in principle, uh, I am pretty much against automatic substitution. Because we're a small hospital and we're 24 hours a day now, I prefer that the pharmacist contact the physician and educate the physician. So uh, no, and actually I don't think, if I have one or two automatic substitutions, I, I, maybe I do, but usually it's a clarification of orders that requires a pharmacist to call the physicians. But keep in mind that we are 160 beds, but it could be about 140, 130. It varies every day, of course, so we're a small hospital. But I am not in favor of automatic substitution in a small institution like ours. Mm -hmm. I could say that um, we, don't, we haven't implemented any new automatic substitutions um, due to this shortage. Okay, um, Lisa, no other questions? No other questions. Well, I think that that actually brings us right to the perfect timing as far as conclusion of this teleconference, which has been just fantastic. I'll, I'll just sort of take us a step back to, uh, to Richard's presentation where he really uh, set the stage beautifully and uh, discussed, you know, we are a publicly funded system that interacts with that free market system, and this for sure is the game changer, as he said. And uh, certainly Marcel um, outlining the, the importance of communication and having those right systems set up and uh, making sure that people really know what's going on. And then, of course, finishing up with Regis and identifying some of those particular challenges around um, the, the safety issues that come to light when we're dealing with this, everything from look-alike drugs to changes in formulation and, of course, dealing with the pharmacy-prepared doses. I, I can't thank you enough. I think all three of you have uh, contributed to setting up a fantastic uh, perspective, really uh, allowing, allowing us to wrap our heads around um, the challenges that we face and we will probably continue to face for the next, uh, as Richard said, at least 12 to 18 months moving ahead. Uh, thank you both on behalf of CAPSI's uh, National Patient Safety um, Collaborative and um, we We'll love to have you back, maybe even at the end of this, if the end comes to light, and, and hear how things actually settled out in the end. 
Um, and I think if anybody has any questions, they could certainly contact Lisa, and Lisa will forward them on to the various speakers. Any other comments from your end, Lisa and Elaine? None from here. Just a great big thank you to everyone. All right, and everybody have a wonderful weekend, and uh, we'll see you again uh, on the fourth Friday of the month in May.